Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Encouraging you to live as an ambassador of God's kingdom in the world. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. If we're gonna fly, we fly like eagles. Arms out wide. If we're gonna fear, we fear no evil. We will rise by your power. We will go by your spirit. We are bold. If we're gonna stand, we stand as giants. If we're gonna walk, we walk as lions. Well, her brow uh, furrowed. And it was obvious that I had either said something she just agreed with or found offensive or that I had used a word that she didn't know or in a way that she didn't understand. And so I stopped because, you know, talking isn't just about talking. It's about active listening. And so what's happening, what's happening in the body language and with the facial expression um, of the person with whom I'm talking, not to whom I'm talking. So there you go. Uh, Furrowed brow. I stopped. Hey, do I need to clarify something, clarify something that I just said? And immediately her face softened and she could tell that I was actually listening while I was talking. I was listening to her facial expressions and her body language while I was talking. We were um, halfway through what I would describe as a lukewarm cup of coffee. She's about my age, but our lives are very, very different. Um... I met her in the bleachers at a school event about a year ago, and then I ran into her at our very local grocery store when she was standing in the aisle, like, studying the toilet paper options. I mean, we've all been there, right? Studying the toilet paper options. I said, I can't believe the price of toilet paper, because that's like the God honest truth. I can't believe the cost of toilet paper today. <laughs> She nodded in agreement and and looked up, and that's when she said, hey, we met at a school thing. I'm Sharon. You're Carmen, right? And I said, yes, I am. And from there, um, the conversation just, like, casually roamed around all the topics of our life and our little community, and eventually we came back around to the cost of toilet paper. And that's when Sharon said, I never thought I'd be here. Um, and you know that moment when a person's spirit like is downcast and you can tell. Yeah, well, this was that moment. I never thought I'd be standing trying to figure out how to afford to buy toilet paper. Seemed like one of those moments where it's just better not to say anything. So we just both stood there and looked at the price of toilet paper, (laughs) silent together. And, you know, I don't want to go so far as to say, you know, the Lord spoke to me in that moment because, like, that's a little bit ridiculous. But I did feel nudged. I did feel nudged. And then, of course, there's that total uncomfortable moment when you're nudged and um, and you have to decide, do I follow what feels like the leading of the Holy Spirit or do I mind my own business and just, like, you know, move on, push my cart and move on? And so I just said, Sharon, which one do you actually want? And she pointed to a particular brand and size. And I mean, you know, you know, there's lots of options out there, which is also a little bit crazy. So I picked it up and I put it in my cart, my cart. And I said, Sharon, finish your shopping, get what you need and don't worry any more about the toilet paper. On this one thing today, God's got you covered. Because you and I both know today's got enough other worries for today, right? And she smiled and she received the blessing. And you know what? That's what I most appreciated in the moment. I appreciated that she didn't resist the blessing. She didn't say, you don't have to do that. She didn't say, I'll figure it out. You know, she just received the blessing that God sent in the form of, you know, a person willing to buy a pack of toilet paper. She moved on and so did I. And I checked out with... Only three of the four things that I had come in for because I was also checking out with one thing I had not known I was coming in for, and that was toilet paper. It's a really small store. So I told the gal at the checkout that the toilet paper was for Sharon, who was, I'm pretty sure, like the only other person in the store at the time. So I said, hey, when she comes through, just put it in her cart. And the gal at the register smiled and said, that's really nice. And I said, yeah, it's not actually from me. 
It's one of those strange ways that God wanted to just show his love today for Sharon. And the gal at the cash register smiled again and she said, that's even nicer. It led to a follow-up coffee conversation with Sharon with the furrowed brow. We might circle back around to the rest of that story at a later time, but the point today was Romans chapter 12. Because we started this year together on Mornings with Carmen. We started this year together with Romans chapter 12 as our like blueprint for discipleship. Like this is, this is not just what God says in Romans chapter 12, but this is who we're called to be as Christians in the world today. This blueprint for a beautiful integrated life of discipleship where we walk in the ways of Jesus all the days of our life. And so today's Growing Your Faith verse of the day comes from that chapter, from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. Don't just pretend to love others, Paul says. Really love them. Hate what's wrong, hold tightly to what is good, and love each other with genuine affection. Take delight in honoring each other. You honor me every single day with your presence here. You honor me. You live into this, not just pretending, but really loving. You honor me with your presence. And I love you genuinely with genuine affection that comes from Christ. And I want to encourage you, in a world that's desperate to know the love of God, I want to encourage you to love someone intentionally and tangibly today. When you see a need, insofar as you are able, meet the need. Sacrifice something that you were going to do or that you were going to buy in order that someone else might know that God really loves them today. Because you really love them today. Tangibly. And then you got to tell them so. You got to say something crazy like, it's not actually me, it's Jesus. And then just let the truth stand there in all of its naked goodness and beauty. Awkward? Yes. Wonderfully awkward. Could you do that today? I know you can. I want to hear reports back from the mission field of everyday life as you walk your faith out into the world that God so loves. Amen? Amen. Our brother Mark Caleb Smith is going to join us next. Um, You've probably been hearing that the... uh, uh, the trials related to the former president are, you know, sort of like rolling through all kinds of processes. So something has happened that um, helps us understand and define the concept of immunity and who, who is immune from um, the prosecution of the laws of the United States of America. Like, is anybody above the law? That is what this conversation is ultimately about. So we have the uh, the supreme justice of God in view, but we also have the laws of the land in view as we have this conversation. That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. Dr. Mark Caleb Smith is back. He's the dean of the School of Arts and Humanities at Cedarville University. Good morning, Mark. Morning, Carmen. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm well. I am well. How are you? I'm uh, doing doing pretty well. Yeah, it's been uh, been an interesting few weeks, hasn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, both, you know, on the personal and interpersonal level, there's always something going on in our everyday lives. And then we, you know, raise our heads up far enough to catch a glimpse of what's going on um, in in the news headlines of the day. And then we're like, what is that? So this is one of those moments. So we've raised up uh, our attention to this ruling by a federal appeals court panel Um, that unanimously ruled that the former president of the United States, Donald Trump, is not immune from charges um, related to the 2020 election results. So talk with us about immunity, um, particularly when it comes to a president of the United States, and then what what you think this ruling means. Well, we really don't have a lot of concrete ideas of presidential immunity because it's such an unusual um, set of circumstances. Um, Everyone agrees that the president really can't be charged for a crime uh, for activities that he's taking on while president of the United States, uh, if as long as they're not personal. So if he's doing official duties as president, he really can't be prosecuted or charged for a crime uh, by the justice system. 
And I think that's a reasonable standard because you really don't want courts trying to undermine the president and re restrict his ability to do his job and things of that nature. The question here is whether the president can be criminally charged for activities he did while president that may be related to his official actions themselves. And so the question here, of course, is whether or not President Trump and his uh, efforts to push back against the election results in 2020, um, and that includes everything from talking to state officials to um, putting together a rally that led to the riot, which created the problems at the Capitol. And so can the president be held criminally responsible for some of those activities? That's really the, the, what the a D.C. Circuit Court was trying to hear. Um, as you said, a, a three-judge panel heard the arguments and ultimately determined that, as of right now, the president does not have immunity from this kind of, of, of legal action. So the charges against him still stand. He can still be tried under those charges, according to this ruling. Um, but of course, as you know, Donald Trump's going to appeal this, and we could see this play out for a bit longer even still. Um, what is, what is immunity? I know, I know we don't, again, have a really clear definition, but then it's really hard for us to operate in, in a conversation or even understand as citizens, like, what does this mean and how do we engage? Immunity means I'm above the law. I mean, is, is, would that, is that one way of saying it? I'm immune from prosecution means that law does not apply to me because of my position, in this case, as president of the United States. Uh, it, it wouldn't necessarily be that that law doesn't apply to me. It, more of it would be that these actions that I'm undertaking are part of my duties as president. Therefore, uh, they're not subject to the same kind of review that a citizen mm -hmm. might have. You know, so, for example, uh, the president could order a military action that could result in the death of human beings. Uh, it, none of us would think in almost any situation that the president should be prosecuted for murder in a situation like that, even though his actions directly led to the killing of people. Um, and so we start, it, it gets to be complicated because we start to think through, you know, does this include everything? What if the president's action is illegal? What if his order is immoral and illegal? What if he orders the assassination of a political rival? Well, I think all of us would say then at that point, clearly he's violated the law and once he's out of office, <clears throat> he should be prosecuted under the fullest extent of the law in a situation like that. And so, yeah, I, I know it's a little bit of a of a gray area, uh, but that's partly why uh, these kind of cases are so important. They're trying to put some clarity into this concept. We are, um, I think everybody knows, in the midst of the next political election cycle um, for those who want to serve um, as president of the United States, there are a lot of people running for president. Um, we have a listener who's among the 1,500 people running for president. Um, I was reminded of that a couple of days ago on the text line. Um, lots of people um, want to be president of the United States, which is actually kind of extraordinary that so many people want to run. Um, we only know the names, really, of a handful of them. There's only a handful of people who whose profiles maybe are raised um, high enough uh, that we become aware that they're running for president. And then obviously in, in our country, it, it normally comes down to two. And that's because we have a, a party system that really silences every voice, but, <laughs> but the voice of two. Um, and so there is this um, process of nominating a candidate, both for the Democratic Party and for the Republican Party, um, uh, the RNC and the DNC. And those nomination processes are currently what's happening. Um, it's not a done deal. Tell us what ha is happening in um, Nevada. Yeah. So as you said, these nomination contests are still unfolding. Um, what's going on in Nevada is just a little bit bizarre in some ways um, because they've had a presidential primary, which is one kind of, of election, They've also had a presidential caucus, which is a different kind of election. Um, and Nikki Haley was running in the presidential primary. Donald Trump was running in the presidential caucus. <laughs> and so they were both running in Nevada for the Republican nomination, uh, but they weren't technically running in the same race. Um, 
Nevada has an interesting law that if there's more than one candidate competing for an office, then a primary has to happen as opposed to a caucus. And But the Republican Party in Nevada basically ignored that and went forward and held their caucus anyway. And so we ended up with this weird result where Donald Trump wins the caucus. Nikki Haley competes in the primary, but doesn't win, which is interesting. Uh, she actually lost out to uh, we prefer none of these candidates, which was the other option on the ballot. And so uh, the the conversation is still moving forward. Donald Trump's going to win a handful of delegates in Nevada. Nikki Haley says the whole system is crazy in Nevada anyway. We didn't really compete there. And they're going to move forward regardless. And so we still have a contest taking place. Uh, I don't know how competitive it's going to be, uh, but as of right now, we have two major Republicans who are at least in a position to to vie for it. On the Democratic side, uh, Joe Biden is still cruising his way toward a nomination. Uh, he has a little bit of a challenge here and there, but it's really nothing significant at the moment. And from an eternal perspective, um, we will be four years from now in this cycle again. Um, and so um, from God's perspective of things, nations rise and fall. There are leaders um, lifted up in seasons and four seasons. Um, and we, as people who live in a country where we have the opportunity to vote, um, my encouragement is that you exercise um, the liberty to vote, that you exercise the liberty that other people around the world do not have, which is to prayerfully consider um, who God is leading you to vote for, and then exercise that right. There will be Christians, Mark, this year who do not vote because they don't see a candidate um, that they can in good conscience vote for. And so um, I we just I acknowledge that as well. Um, when we come back uh, from a very brief break, can we talk about what freedom means and who decides like the scope of a freedom that's guaranteed in the First Amendment of the Constitution? Absolutely. All right. What does freedom mean? What does freedom mean to you? What are you free to believe? And what are the limits of the freedom of your religious expression in the United States? Um, What are you free to say? And what are the limits of the freedom of your speech? Yep, that is under conversation at the Supreme Court. So we're going to talk about that next here on Mornings with Carmen. 150 million people 150 million people actively use one particular app every month in the United States of America. I want that to be the Faith Radio app. How about you? If you're wondering how you could be encouraged in your faith at any time, anywhere, well, I got good news for you. There's literally an app for that. You can listen to Faith Radio live, any show on demand, no matter where you are at any time of the day or night. Download the free Faith Radio app right now. It's super easy. Just text the word APP to 877-933-2484 and click the link. Let's connect faith to life. What are you free to believe? I mean, from the beginning of time, you've been free to believe um, whatever you want. God actually creates you with the perfect freedom of your will. And so you're free to believe. You're not always free to express those beliefs. And that leads us to conversations around the world about blasphemy laws and anti-conversion laws and laws that you have to believe certain things. Um, Here in the United States, you are not only free to believe, but you are free to express those beliefs. That's guaranteed in the um, First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. Also guaranteed there is that you're free to speak free to speak your mind. Um, But what are the limits of the freedom of speech? Well, that is actually under conversation now. The Supreme Court is being asked to weigh in um, on what you can say. Um, Mark, um, what what exactly is at issue here? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's an important conversation to get into when we talk about constitutional liberties. I think our conception is that they're absolute, you know, that I have an absolute freedom of speech or I have an absolute free exercise of religion. Um, But I think if we take a step back and look at them a little critically, we understand none of them are really absolute. Um, You know, I may have the um, free exercise of religion, but if I think my religion includes the ability to sacrifice a child, a living child, then I'm going to be curtailed in the exercise of my liberty because it's creating other problems. It's, it's creating 
it's harming other people or it's destabilizing society in a way that it's going to be limited. And so free speech is is, is the same thing. I mean, we, are, we always have limitations on things that we can say in certain situations. Um, the court, the Supreme Court's regularly allowed for restrictions um, based on things like fighting words. So if you say something that elicits a violent response or creates an unrest or a riot, you can be held responsible for that. Um, certain forms of obscenity certainly can be restricted um, <clears throat> by the government. And we also have what are called time, place, and manner restrictions. So it isn't so much what I'm saying, but I can be limited in where I say it, for example, or the context in which I'm allowed to say things. And so as, this public, as a public school student, for instance, I can't stand on my desk and yell obscenities at my teacher and say it's free speech. Well, I'm a student in public school. The government's going to be able to restrict my ability to speak in some situations just because of where I am and the activity that's going on around me. And so right now, the issue, at least in front of the court, is uh, can we be restricted in pushing misinformation or wrong information? Uh, this all really grew out of the COVID uh, situation where people were using social media to push arguably incorrect information about the virus. And the Biden administration stepped in and tried to pressure the social media platforms uh, to restrict that information, to pull down some of the accounts, to maybe uh, limit the reach of some of those posts, and also to trumpet what the Biden administration considered to be good, good speech in a situation like this. And as you might expect, this raises all sorts of questions. Is this censorship? Um, or is this just a question of the government recommending good information? Can the government also pull back whatever it defines as bad information? And so this is an important case, I think, in front of the court. There's a lot of, hey, this will be a news, um, a news alert, Mark. There's a lot of bad information on social media. <laughs> <laughs> it's so shocking. I'm just yes. saying if we start down a path where um, everything that is untrue posted on social media – uh, is going to be limited because of the harm it may present to others. Yeah, there's going to be no end to the things that I'm going to raise my hand about and be like, uh, that is harmful uh, and not true. And I think that because it's not true, it ought to be, uh, you know, it, it ought to be expunged. That person ought to not be allowed to post on social media if they persist in this belief. And that right. is that is where I think that the freedom of speech conversation is connected to the freedom of religion and religious expression conversation. Not everybody agrees with me, although it's true with a capital T, not everybody agrees with me that Jesus is Lord and the only way to salvation. And I will continue to um, persist in posting that everywhere all the time and speaking my mind related to it. Um, at, at what point does my freedom and liberty to say such things um, become limited because some ruling party or majority spirit of the age in which I live says, yeah, we're not going to let you say that in this place in that way, um, because that is hurtful and harmful to everybody who doesn't agree with you that Jesus is the only way to salvation. Like there's a limiting, um, it sounds like a limiting threat. Um, if I quote scripture and say, um, that those who lead the little ones astray, it'd be better for them if, you know, a millstone was tied around their neck and thrown into the sea. I'm quoting the Bible. Um, and yet that sounds like a material threat to some people, like fighting words um, or or literal threat of harm to another. Um, we are entering into challenging days, I believe, as Christians at this point of what are you free to say and where are you free to say it and who has the right to limit that speech um, particularly when it's a, it is a theological claim that I am making um, that is a, is a judgment. It's a, it, it's, it's a statement of judgment, and I acknowledge that. So um, am I right in connecting uh, in tying all these threads together? Yeah, yeah, I, I believe so. And, I, and I, that's why I think we have to be really careful uh, if we're going to open the, the door here for government to step in and label something as misinformation um, and therefore give them the power to pressure social media companies uh, to respond in this way. At the same time, I think we also have to acknowledge that social media companies are probably going to still have the ability to regulate their platforms as they see fit 
You know, they're not the government. They're not restricted by the First Amendment in the same way. There's a lot of argument about that, whether or not they should be treated differently because of their outsized role in society. You know, maybe we should regulate them like we do utilities, for example, and not treat them with quite the same um, amount of freedom that they would have otherwise. And so, yeah, this is an unfolding uh, question. And uh, how it gets settled is going to be pretty important culturally. You know, when we think of what's happened in places like Canada, um, when it comes to some free speech issues around religion, and even in Great Britain, when it comes to issues around religion, you can see how if your society does not robustly protect free speech, uh, certainly religious speech is going to be brought to bear at some point. Mark, as always, uh, thank you so much. It's, a, it's always a blessing to have you with us. Um, thank you to those of you texting in this morning. Totally appreciate you being here. I also appreciate that you loved the toilet paper story at the outset um, of the conversation today and um, particularly appreciate the Kypernium humor brought to bear um, on this. Every square inch, every square inch. Now, that is a reference to Abraham Kuyper's very famous quote, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Yeah, I am totally going to come up with a way to make that apply to the every square inch conversation uh, <clears throat> related to, can you spare a square? Mm-hmm. Do, do you know what I'm saying when I ask, can you spare a square? Surely you can spare a square, not even a square. Every square inch, my friend, every square inch, you can bring the mind of Christ to bear even on a conversation about sparing a square. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, Johnny Erickson Tata is well known um, and beloved by uh, by many of us. If you don't know about Johnny and Friends, um, then that is a ministry that I want you to know about as well. And when Johnny Erickson Tata says, um, this, this is the person who picks up my story where I left off, this is a person to listen to. Um, you need to know her. Um, I pay attention. And so uh, Hilda Bimula is going to join us next. She is the person that Johnny Erickson Tata is pointing to and saying, this is the person who picks up the story where I left it off. And so we're going to talk with the girl um, who has special shoes. Miracles don't always look like you'd expect. That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. Hilda Bimula is joining us now. Hilda, welcome to Mornings with Carmen. Hi, Carmen. Great to be here. Thanks for having it me. It is so wonderful to meet you, albeit, uh, you know, over uh, over this technology. I wish we were face to face so that um, so that, you know, we could be eye to eye having this conversation. But I'll um, I'll look at you and you look at me um, and we'll uh, and we'll talk with each other about the goodness of God and his greatness and his glory would you um would you tell us your story? Oh um my name is Hilda B. Muller. I come from a loving family uh that is based in Cameroon. And uh Cameroon is somewhere around West Central Africa. That's where I was born in a little town called Bamenda. And uh so growing up in Cameroon, I went to church a lot as a little girl. But at some point, it was realized that I was also developing a debilitating disease, which caused me to lose mobility. So also growing up, I started um, asking a lot of questions of God about why my body was not like everyone else's. And, uh, you know, all of those questions and wondering why I had to suffer more than other people, why I had to see suffering around me. And my questions landed me to a place where I I started thinking about uh, God in different ways other than what I had learned in Sunday school growing up. You know, I made conclusions about God not being loving because if he was, then he wouldn't let this happen to me. I decided to rebel against going to church, going to God, reading the Bible and all that. And my life was really miserable because I would look around and feel that it was not worth going on in life if I had to just keep feeling weaker and probably end up in a wheelchair. 
which God has a sense of humor. I'm in a wheelchair now. But at that time, I never imagined life living in a wheelchair. You know, so in high school, when I was around 17, I read um, Johnny Erickson's book along with another book um, by a gentleman called Edmund Haggai. The title of that book is My Son, Johnny. And those books really helped to shift my perspective about who God is and how God lo God's love looks. And those books helped me come to the Lord. And from that moment on, I've been walking with the Lord, getting to know his grace, getting to know his love, and uh, getting to um, see the miracle that he does with my story and with our stories. So that in brief is my story. Hmm. Hilda, thank you. Um, thank you for sharing that and giving us a window into um, the way God has transformed your life. Um, you acknowledge that, um, you know, you're now in a wheelchair. And so the ways in which you um, prayed as a, as a child were not answered in the way that you asked. I'd like to talk with you about sort of how we live when God answers us differently than, than the way that we ask. Um, you are also a sister in Christ acquainted with suffering. And, um, and I'd like to talk with you about um, the reality of suffering and how that can lead us to imagine that we are forsaken or that um, the things that limit us physically might limit God's ability or desire to use us for his glory. Because those are all the threads that are woven in your book. Um, and so it's such a gift. Again, let me just remind you um, that we are talking with Hilda B. Mula, her book, The Girl with Special Shoes. Miracle, um, miracles don't always look like you'd expect. Um, and I can send you direct links to connect with Hilda online as well. Just text me, 877-933-2484. So let's, um, let's, start, um, let's start, Hilda, with prayer. Talk with me about prayer and um, maybe the development over time of your understanding of how God answers us. Hmm. I'm, I'm so glad you asked that because from the outset, um, you know, growing up, going to church, you know that you pray, you sing, and you recite these things to God and you expect him to answer exactly uh, how you want him to. And so part of my frustration as I grew older and I grew weaker in my body was that I wasn't seeing God react in that way. I wasn't seeing God answer me in the ways that I expected you know so at some point i wondered if god really was listening i wondered if there was god at all but the great miracle for me has been how the lord has shaped my heart and helped me to see that when i pray it's not so much about my will being done as much as his will being done it's still a work in progress but i'm learning that prayer is not so much about uh, just having my needs met as much as getting to know the Lord. And mm -hmm. it's a, a, a great blessing and a great um, perspective shifting thing for me because, you know, when you live with suffering, it is uncomfortable. It is distressing on the body. And always our default is to want to do away with that suffering. But the Lord uses that to help me see how dependence on him uh, is a good thing and how his power is made perfect, you know, in my weakness and how his grace is enough. And so prayer becomes this beautiful thing of just surrendering to the Lord and watching him do the work in me, as opposed to me coming to him and telling him what he ought to do. You know, a lot of times I've had to lay back in bed as I whisper a prayer in pain or something. And I'm like, well, Lord, you know, and it's enough that he knows. Well, Lord, you are God, and it's enough that you are God. You know, and so it's taken really the Lord's working on my heart. Because when I compare that to a few years back when I used to be like, God, you have to do this to me. You have to, you have to heal my body. You know, and now just surrender 
I see that the Lord has brought me a long ways from that early life and also from the false notion that I had then that uh, prayer is about me commanding God to do what I want him to do. Yeah, there is an aspect of um, bringing our bringing my supplications to him and bringing my cares, as the Bible says, casting my cares upon him. But I'm learning that prayer is about, yes, casting them upon him and watching him do what he can do. And I, I say in the book, uh, The Girl with Special Shoes, that when we let God write our stories, he does a much better job than we can ever do. You know, so I'm learning to surrender more as an aspect of prayer. I'm learning to trust him more. And in the process of that, I'm learning to see the beauty of just God working through my weakness. Hilda, that is um, that is so honest and so good and so beautiful and so true. So thank you so much for being just such a magnificent reflection of um, what it looks like to be a person who trusts in the Lord and surrenders um, more and more to him all the time, because I also appreciate you recognize um, the reality that you, like every single one of us, is still a work in progress, and God's not done yet. And I love that, and that's exciting. Um, it's also a little bit terrifying when we admit that um, as well, because we're like, you know, who knows yeah. what God's going to do next. So, <clears throat> um, But it's going to be for our good and for his glory, and so we trust in that. What does it mean to you Amen. to be an instrument or a tool in God's hands? I mean, you you talk about being used by God. Um, what does what does it mean to you to to be a person who is in His hands, used as an instrument or a tool for His glory? Hmm. Uh, I don't know if humbling comes close to really describing it because, you know, I also came up in my culture, um, disability is like, like most other cultures is looked upon as sort of a, a bad omen, mm. you know? So I had also imbibed that message of your body is weakening, your body is broken, your body is disabled, and therefore your life is not worth anything. And another part of the miracle that God has performed in my life is just letting me know that I'm loved by him and that I'm created in his image and his likeness. You know, so it is a huge thing for me to come from a place of being told that I'm not worth anything to a place of being loved by the almighty God and being told by the almighty God that I can use you no matter how you are, no matter how you look, no matter what circumstances, no matter what people have said, to have, have told you or what you have believed in the past. So it's it's just um, it's just such a life transforming reality for me to know that God would love me. And I don't know how much of an instrument I can be with that. He would choose such as me, you know, to um, perform these miracles in my life, to let his light shine. You know, that verse in Second Corinthians 4 that talks about this light shining from jars of clay. I consider myself a very broken jar. And even in me, the Lord lets his light shine. You know, so it's indescribable to see the God of the universe choosing someone from a, a, an unknown village somewhere in the world and choosing to let my story be heard, choosing to let his light dwell in me and by his grace to let other people know about that light. So it's it's I I I find it difficult really to to explain what that means, but it is the reality that has transformed and is transforming my life. Hilda, you remind me that sometimes when we're asked a question, um, it's the words are um, are sometimes difficult to find to adequately describe um, the reality that we want to point to. And let me just say this, your life and the tone of your voice and the joy we hear um, is a part of the way that, um, that that light is shining and illuminating us right now. And so 
uh, you are clearly being used by God in really extraordinary ways. Um, He's using you right now um, to speak to me and to um, and to others. Um, And so, you know, we might ask uh, we might ask the question, you know, what what good could come from Nazareth? Um, What good can come from Beminda, Cameroon? Um, but God, but God, but God, but you are God, such a but God. You are, I mean, yeah, you, you are such a but God girl. Um, we're going to continue our conversation with Hilda here in just a moment. Uh, I am um, I'm thrilled to send you guys the link to connect with her directly and her website, Hilda B B I H, Hilda B dot com. Her book, The Girl with Special Shoes. Uh, Miracles don't always look like you'd expect. Um, It is interesting, though, that miracles tend to sound like we have come to expect from friends like um, like Johnny Erickson Tata. And there's definitely a a resonance um, between the two of you. And we'd love to hear that today. So more with Hilda in just a moment. You're listening to Mornings with Carmen. This is your birthday song. It isn't very long. Hey! Faith Radio is celebrating 75 years of bringing faith to life. That's right. We are 75 this year. So to celebrate, we are giving away 75 Faith Radio birthday boxes packed with all kinds of fun things to help you grow in your walk of faith and, yes, celebrate with us. So we're going to be celebrating the birth and growth and future of Faith Radio all year long, and you are an integral part of the Faith Radio family, and so we want to send you a gift. How fun is that? This is our birthday song. It isn't very long. So to enter to win a Faith Radio birthday box today, come to MyFaithRadio.com. We're talking with Hilda B. Mueller. The website is Hilda B, B uh, B-I-H.com. I'm happy to send you the direct links to um, Hilda and her ministry and her book, The Girl with Special Shoes. Miracles don't always look like you'd expect. Um... The uh, the preface, the uh, the invitation into the book comes from our mutual friend, Johnny Erickson Tata. Um, and Johnny really points to Hilda as the person who picks up the story where um, where Johnny's uh, story trails off. And so I want to acknowledge the greatness of the ministry of Johnny and Friends. And if you're not familiar with that, I want you to be so. Um, Hilda, um, let's um, let's jump into the book. Tell us about the walk to school. <laughs> um, going to school for me was not like every other person. If you're familiar with the way most people go to school in Africa, we have to trek long distances. And uh, trekking, obviously, for me, with the mobility problems I had, was very difficult. And uh, I didn't have a wheelchair for most of the time that I had to trek. And so going to school has been. Um, a great blessing, but while I was going, I thought it was the greatest curse in my life. So I'll get up every day wishing that I didn't have to go to school because I needed to, with the little mobility I had, I needed to trek for a distance when I could. And then I'll have either my parents or my siblings or other members of the family pick me up on a back ride. You know, so sometimes I felt so humiliated as a big girl, you know, being carried on the back to school and having to answer questions all the time. But my parents believed so much in education that they did not let any of the negative comments deter them from sending me to school. You know, so it's been... um I look back now and I laugh at it and I laugh at how I got frustrated a lot of the times. And in the book, I just narrate one of the scenes where I got to a point where I just wanted to give up. I just wanted to die. Uh, But yeah, the journey of going to school was a lot of scenes, a lot of changing scenes. But the interesting thing is that even in that very fluid and changing journey, I could see God's hand at work. Now, looking back, I see the hand of providence because before I got a wheelchair, I hadn't lost, um, how do I say it? The Lord just led me with enough mobility to survive for each of the steps that I needed. 
And when I finally lost the ability to walk, then I got uh, not a, wheel, a tricycle, which served me for a few years until I got to university. And a lot of people ask me, how did you go? How did you write? How did you do this? I'm like, God just gave me the barest minimum because I would struggle and write and do exams. And I didn't have any technology to assist or any presence of mind to even ask my teachers to give me more time. And now I'm not able to write anymore with my hands. And I'm like, whoa. At that time when I needed it, the Lord gave me that ability. You know, yeah, so going to school probably would be another book someday because it has so many stories, so many interesting stories, so many heartbreaking stories, but also just the hand of providence over it all. Yeah, the hand of providence and the Lord providing um, just what is needed um, and no more, um, but just what is needed at a particular step along the journey. And it occurs to me, you know, now, Hilda, that um, you don't, because of technology, you can write with your words without having to write with your hands. And exactly. I think of the extraordinary gift that that is. And um, uh, and the things that I take for granted in my life that are absolute um would be a miracle. They would be a miracle of grace if God made them available to you. And I don't right. acknowledge them as a miracle of grace every day. And that is one of the one of the very real gifts that you bring um, to the body of believers. You um, you help me see the extraordinary gift of God's grace in 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 my mobility, um, in my ability to pick up a pen and casually write something down, um, so many of the things that I take for granted in my everyday life would be extraordinary miracles if you if, if God were to make it possible for you to do them. And yet, through technology, God has made it possible for you to do extraordinary things. It's just amazing. Amen. Amen. Um, I look forward to meeting you one day face-to-face, -face, um, but thank you so much <laughs> for the privilege of meeting you over this technology today. I look forward to meeting you today. Thank you. Uh, to meeting you too. And thank you. It's such a joy to be here and yeah, to see what the Lord is doing in not just mine, but yours and the lives of all the people that you get to meet on this show. Um, it's it's a beautiful tapestry, you know. I pride myself in the fact that I come from another culture, but it's just a joy to see that God's grace is working in all of our lives in different places and that someday we'll be able to just get together and celebrate what he has done, the real miracle of grace. Amen. Amen. Um, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Hilda, thank you so much for the joy of the Lord so evident um, in your spirit, and thank you for the gift of your time um, today. All right, friends, we um, we just have a few seconds here together at the end of this hour, but we have another hour of Mornings with Carmen up next, wondering what uh, your heart-hitting news is today, what's on your heart. Is there something happening in the culture or in the world that you'd like to talk about and seek to gain God's perspective on as we seek to apprehend the mind of Christ and apply it to the matters of the day. You can always text me. You know, what's the heart, what's uh, what's on your heart to talk about and what's the heart hitting news for you this morning? 877-933-2484. Oh yes, I'm happy to send you links uh, to Hilda um, again on the text line as well. You are listening to Mornings with Carmen. I'm Carmen LeBurge and we will be right back. Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LeBurge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.